1 Kings 16, 29 through 33. I just want to read verses and set this up. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, began his reign of 22 years over Israel in Samaria. And Ahab, son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all before him. As if it had been a light thing for Ahab to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, he took for a wife Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and served Baal and worshipped him. So Jezebel convinces her husband to worship her foreign god, the king of Israel, but also introduces the worship of that god to the people of Israel. And the worship and sacrificial practices of Baal were horrific. And I'm not even going to touch on them. Horrific. Baal was known as the god of fertility and of weather, specifically rainstorms, also being referred to as the lord of rain and dew, which will come into play very soon. Ahab did more, verse 33, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel before him. That's a big statement. And we're going to jump around. Like I said, go to 1 Kings 17, verse 1. And if you want to star these as we go, you can. It will we'll add up soon. 1 Kings 17, verse 1. Elijah the Tishbite of the temporary residence of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew or rain these years, but according to my word. And the my's capital there it wasn't Elijah's word. He was speaking for God. You know, you want to worship a foreign God of dew and rain? Then you can rely on it to bring you dew and rain. And there was a drought that lasted three years. Go to 1 Kings 18, 1 through 4. 1 Kings 18, 1 through 4. Or 1 through 4. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. And a lot happens in between, which you can read on your own, but I just want to set the stage here. Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab called Obadiah, who was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets, hid them by fifties in a cave, and fed them with bread and water during a drought. Now cut off here doesn't mean that they were laid off or fired. Look at verse 13 in this chapter. Jump down. Was it not my Lord what I did? Or was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So Jezebel slaughtered the prophets of the Lord. Ahab and Jezebel were wicked. And as we read... Continue from this point on. Every time a moment that required Elijah to extend or exercise his faith is mentioned, I'm going to say that took faith. That took faith. And if you want to repeat it after me, I welcome you to. Or if you want to start for another point, I encourage you to. Look at 1 Kings 18. 17 through 46. And we're going to be here for a moment. 1 Kings 18, 17 through 46. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Are you he who troubles Israel? How deceived Ahab had allowed himself to become. But for Elijah to even go and stand before Ahab, knowing that Ahab would want to kill him, that took faith. Elijah replied, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, 
and your father's house by forsaking the commandments of the Lord and by following the Baals. So not only did Elijah have faith to stand before Ahab, he calls him out. That took faith. You know, we can be faced with a problem or an issue. What do we choose to do with that problem or issue? Do we confront it in faith? It's not the same to have it confront us as it is for us to confront it back and speak to it as it pertains to us. Trusting God to face a problem takes faith, but to boldly confront and speak to it while facing it, putting it in its place, requires even greater faith. Verse 19, Therefore send and gather to me all Israel. Everyone in the nation was summoned to witness what was about to happen. That took faith. It's going to get louder and stronger as I go. Gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the goddess Asherah who eat at Queen Jezebel's table. So Elijah wasn't looking to have a strategic meeting with Israel first, right? In order to deliver a rousing speech, getting them all fired up before he calls in these 800 and so prophets. Elijah was so confident in his faith in God that he summons them all at once. That took faith. Look at verse 20. So Ahab sent to all the Israelites and assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. Now, Mount Carmel would serve several purposes, and I want to break this down real quick. First, Elijah was gathering the people near a mountain, the same way Jesus would later do, as well as Jesus would get into a boat and he'd push off the shore as the crowds gathered along the shoreline. I'll never forget this because Dave B. shared this with me. They both knew when you're up on a mountain, sound travels better down the side of a mountain. Or if you're in a boat, sound travels better on the water which is helpful when you're addressing a large crowd. So Elijah had wisdom in the natural. Second, the altar of God was atop Mount Carmel, which Jezebel had destroyed at some point. Third, Elijah was positioning himself on that mountain because 15 miles east because he was going to be 15 miles east of the Mediterranean Sea. And they'd be able to witness from a greater height the start of the second miracle that would immediately follow the first. And if you know the story, you know where I'm going. They weren't at ground level. He was up on a mountain. Elijah was also clearly hearing from God and obediently following his instructions. And when we stop and listen, church, to the voice of God and obediently follow what he instructs us to do, we will find that God positions us right where he needs us to be. To experience miracles and receive his promises. Amen? And that's for everybody. I also thought here, why was Ahab even doing what Elijah was requesting? Which was a huge undertaking and a time-consuming demand to gather all of Israel and these 800 and so 50 prophets? Why didn't Ahab just kill Elijah on the spot? The first words out of his mouth are, aren't you the one who we should be blaming for all of this? I believe from what we will soon see as this miraculous counter plays out, if Ahab had executed Elijah on the spot, he knew he risked making him a martyr. And it could have incited Israel to rebel against him, especially given they were in the middle of a severe three-year drought, right? For the past three years, right after Jezebel's rainstorm god of dew and rain has begun to be worshipped, had been introduced, and she just killed all of Israel's prophets, pretty much, except for the ones that were hidden in the caves. The people were probably in a very fragile and volatile state. Ahab had no choice but to let this play out. And then if he saw an opportunity, he could have Elijah executed. 
if he failed at what was about to happen. And then all of Israel, there'd be no negative side, there'd be no negative consequences, and potentially he would gain favor with the people because he could blame Elijah. But then I thought perhaps, just maybe, there was a small part of Ahab because of the state of the nation due to his role. Maybe Ahab was curious of what Elijah was about to do. Just maybe. So look at verse 21. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you halt and limp between two opinions? Elijah was boldly confronting here all of Israel, including Ahab and the 850 so evil prophets. Because instead of serving God and taking a stand against the gods of Baal, the people were choosing to play it safe in self-preservation and just going with the flow. And I think that there are many Christians today that could reflect on this same question. How long will you halt and limp between two options? Or two opinions. There's only one option, church. Nothing has changed from the time of Elijah to now. There will always be some other form of something that will challenge our relationship with God in an attempt to redirect our focus and worship away from him. How long will you halt and limp between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Elijah is saying, make a choice. That took faith. To stand in front of everyone and call them all out for being either fully deceived or just lukewarm. And the people did not answer him a word. Their response was in their non-response. But for Elijah to not go crawl into a hole, think about this. He positioned himself in front of all of Israel and in front of 850 of his enemies. To not go crawl in a hole or join the other prophets in the cave after not receiving anything from the people. That took faith. It takes faith. It takes faith to stand when you get no response. How do we respond to a rejection or to crickets? It says a lot about who we are. This says a lot about who Elijah was. Then Elijah, verse 22, said to the people, I, I only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given us. Let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. I will dress the other bull, lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the one who answers by fire, let him be God. And the people answered, it is well spoken. So Elijah was purposefully setting the stage for what was about to happen. That took faith. As it pertains to us, it's not always easy to put ourselves out there to other people when it comes to making bold faith statements that are going to majorly affect not just us, but others. Because if things don't go our way, right? But church, when we come to a place in our walk with the Lord where we believe in what we are declaring yeah. and in what God can do, then our faith statements are only bold to those around us. Amen. It's not bold to us because we believe it. Because we're confident in God and in his word and in the outcome of our declarations. That takes faith. 
Look at verse 25. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves. You know, oh, how polite Elijah was. Even giving them first pick of the sacrifice like it's going to matter. And dress it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God. But put no fire under it. Verse 26, so they took the bull given them, dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, hear and answer us. But there was no voice. I would underline that, circle it, put a pin there. If I don't get to that this week, I'm going to get to that next week because it pertains to what we're going to talk about. There was no voice. No one answered. And they leaped upon or limped about the altar they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is God. Either he is musing, or he has gone aside, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. Sounds like Elijah had a sense of humor. So Elijah lets them go on for hours. Hours. Some 450 to 850 false prophets before openly mocking them in the presence of Ahab and all of Israel while they continued to unsuccessfully contact their God. And Elijah was doubling down here because in his mocking of them, because when, in his, when his time came, he was confident that God, the true God of Israel, was going to show up. And so he was doubling down. Could have just sat there quiet. But no, he let him have it because he knew what his God was going to do. That took faith. Sometimes it's okay to stay quiet when facing the antagonistic behavior of people. Everyone in the world is so reactive today. We don't need to add to the reactiveness of the world. And maybe sometimes we just need to let them tire themselves out a bit, like Elijah did, and then be spirit-led in our well-timed response in order to inflict maximum, not damage, but truth and revelation upon them. Because our goal is not to hurt people. Our goal is to encourage people. Look at verse 28. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. Midday passed and they played the part of prophets. I underline that as well. They played the part of prophets. The world may look like they know what they're doing, church. And they are confidently going through all the motions. But unless they have a personal relationship with the living God, they are deceived and are just playing a part. And they played the part of prophets until the time for offering the evening sacrifice. And put another pin and underline this, but there was no voice. No answer. No one who paid attention. Isn't it good to know that we serve a God who pays attention? And who answers our prayers? Look at verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And I would imagine that in the background, the other prophets were still frantically giving it an effort. Dancing about as they bled out in vain. What an absolute spectacle that must have been. Church, we cannot let the world distract us when God calls us in close. Because we will miss what he wants to show us. Don't be distracted by the number of spectacles that are in this world, in life, in social media. Let's put the franticness of the world outside of our view as we make a conscious effort to draw closer to God. And I say all the time, God's not up there like this. He's standing there like this. But it's up to us to go to him. 
He always wants to embrace us. And Elijah repaired the old altar of the Lord that had been broken down by Jezebel. That took faith. To take the time to rebuild what was broken in direct defiance to the one who broke it. That's what he was doing. And sometimes the enemy succeeds at breaking things in our life, but God will make a way for those things to be restored. Amen? Verse 31, Then Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones Elijah built an altar in the name and self-revelation of the Lord. And I thought, why didn't Elijah just call upon God to rain down fire upon the other altar? With its already prepared sacrifice that clearly the other prophets had no use for. It would have been a much faster and more convenient and embarrassing for them. More convenient for him, more embarrassing for his opponents. Right? But I think the answer is simple. Because God, through Elijah, needed to ensure that no other source would get any credit for what was about to happen. And someone would have said, oh, look, the altar lit. The, Baals, the Baal gods succeeded. Sometimes in our lives, God doesn't do things the way we expect. Even if we feel it would be much faster and more convenient. Right? If he did it this way, the way we can see a path and understand it, how many of you have been there? We're there now. God, why can't we go this way? But God's ways are higher than our ways. And sometimes it takes longer and causes us to put more time and work in, but the results are intended for our best interests. And to accomplish God's best interests through us for others. Amen? That takes faith. Look at verse 32. Then Elijah made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And I thought, I wonder how many of the people were curious what was the trench for? Because at that point, the trench made no sense. And sometimes God will instruct us to do things in our lives by faith. And those around us don't get it. And that's okay. Maybe it isn't for the world to understand just yet. But what is important is our obedience to God's instructions. The trench here would have been something completely out of the ordinary. That took faith. I mean, you've ever read this story and saw all these incidents where it took faith for Elijah to step out. I always just remember this story as woof, fire came down and it was over. But no, there was a path he had to take. Notice the very lengthy process here as Elijah is taking his time in obedience to every instruction God is giving him. And it appears that he is completing the work all on his own when you read it. Because in a moment when Elijah is done, he finally gives an instruction to others to get them involved. But completing this lengthy process in the natural, that took faith. Look at verse 33. He put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and the wood. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran around the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And I was reading this thinking, those people must have thought, oh, so that's what the trench was for. To collect all the wasted water from 
soaking the sacrifice and creating a moat around the sacrifice? Still made no sense in their eyes. Well, made sense that they saw now what it was for, but made no sense to what was about to happen. But a couple of things here. First of all, when you are in the middle of a spontaneous combustion challenge with your enemies trying to prove a point to an entire nation, it makes no sense to douse your sacrifice for the spontaneous combustion challenge with water. It's very counterproductive. Second of all, second of all, who would waste that amount of precious water in the middle of a three-year drought? It makes absolutely no sense. And I would imagine that some of the people there were murmuring and complaining, as people do, about that fact. But Elijah knew exactly what he was doing because he trusted that God knew exactly what he was doing. We don't have to understand it, church. We just have to trust that God understands it. The third thing is, if they were up on a mountain, how readily available was the water? And I love the way, I had to read this several times, I love the way in which Elijah delivers the instructions with such wisdom, if you noticed. He doesn't tell them to fill 12 jars with water because he's planning to have them soak the burnt offering in the wood three times with four jars. He tells them to fill four jars with water and pour it out. So as little sense as that made, they would have done it and thought, all right, that made no sense, but it's done. Then he tells them, fill four jars with water and pour it out and then do it again. And then once it's done, to do it again. Elijah doesn't start by sharing the full plan. That's using wisdom. If he had told them what he wanted them to do in full, that's when the not-so-helpful suggestions with good intentions come into play. How many of you have been there? You tell someone what you want to do and how God told you to do it, and they're like, that doesn't make any sense. So you have to learn wisdom as to say, well, we're going to do this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then the plan's done, and they don't have time to give you any suggestions. That's for somebody here today. When God gives us a plan that involves others, sometimes we need to ask him for wisdom on how to best relay that plan. So it doesn't leave room for anyone to offer any not-so-helpful suggestions with good intentions. Amen? Because sometimes that might hinder what God is trying to accomplish through us for them. In this case with Elijah, God was stretching the faith of the people this is important, to rebuild in them what had been torn down by Ahab and Jezebel. Because it wasn't just the old altar that was broken down and deteriorating. The spiritual state of Israel had been broken down and was deteriorating. Don't forget how this all began in verse 21. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you halt and limp between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. They were undecided about which direction to go. That is why God instructed Elijah to have the people saturate the sacrifice with water three times. Wasting their precious water during a drought and having them hike up and down a mountain three times to do it because Israel needed more than a demonstration from God. They needed to see and experience an impossible, miraculous demonstration that defied all logic to snap them out of their current state of mind. Amen? And when God was finished, They wouldn't care about the water they had wasted. Sometimes we care too much about our resources and we don't want to release or let go of them when God wants to use them. Even though in his using them, it's helping us and bringing back a bigger blessing. That's for somebody in here tonight. 
they would soon see God's full plan. So don't forget, as I'm sharing these thoughts with you, how many of you are getting something? <clears throat> Elijah is our focus today, because although everything up to this point took faith from Elijah, great faith, very soon we will find him in a place, in a desperate moment where he wants to die, which makes the story even more interesting to me. Look at verse 36. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, so this was an all-day process, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. So that everything that made no sense up to that point will now make sense to the people. Verse 37, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you, the Lord, are God and have turned their hearts back to you. That took faith. Then the fire of the Lord fell. No one could say that Elijah somehow set this fire. Because the fire of the Lord fell. It didn't start from the bottom. It fell from above. And it consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood, which was saturated with water, and the stones, and the dust, and also licked up the water that was in the trench. You want to do a fun study? Go research the temperatures necessary to consume stones and instantly vaporize water, but not disintegrate everyone in the immediate area. Yeah. Only by the focused fire of the Lord could that be accomplished. Nothing man could do. <clears throat> Verse 39, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Israel wasn't undecided anymore. And Elijah said, Seize the prophets of Baal, let no one escape. Elijah now had the attention and the support of the people. Because if he had said, Seize the prophets of Baal earlier, no one would have budged. Because they were in fear and undecided. There was an undeniable shift that took place. When God shows up and his fire falls in our lives, church, there is an undeniable shift that takes place. They seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook, Kishon, and as God's law required, slew them there. And I wondered if the brook was dried up due to the drought. Because previously... Elijah is by a, a, a brook or a riverbed and it had dried up and that's when God told him, go to Ahab. So we know things were dried up. If so, then there would not have been any water to wash away the blood that was spilled. And Ahab was there to witness every death. Some 450 to 850 prophets, however many of them he killed. We know he killed the prophets of Baal and never really specifies what he did with the prophets of Asherah. Verse 41, and Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink. So just imagine what was going through Ahab's mind after witnessing all of this. And Elijah continues, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. And I thought, was there though? Was there any sound yet at that point? Or was that Elijah's faith talking? Because we're about to see nothing had happened in the natural. If not, then that took faith. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, some 15 miles east of the Mediterranean Sea, and he bowed himself down upon the earth, and he put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, and now keep in mind, this was Elijah's servant. And this I'm not going to get into this week. I'm going to touch on it next week. But if you want to read in your own studies this week, this was Elijah's servant. So I'm going to skip a whole section here and we'll come back to it. Now, um, 
And he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. Verse 43, Elijah said, go again seven times. And at the seventh time, the servant said, a cloud as small as a man's hand is arising out of the sea. <clears throat> so here comes a cloud as small as a man's hand arising out of the sea. Now to the natural eyes, that is not a three-year drought-ending storm forming and heading their way. Can we agree? But to Elijah, because of his faith and trust in God, it was enough. And as it pertains to us, what happens to our own expectation level, which will be evident in our confession, what happens when what we see with our natural eyes or if we hear a negative or overwhelming or underwhelming report about something we are believing for, how does it affect our faith and confession? When what we see or hear does not support our expectations of what we are believing God for. In Elijah's case, the underwhelming was more than enough. And I have such a greater respect for the man of God that Elijah was after studying this message. Verse 44, And Elijah said, Go up, say to Ahab, Hit your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. In a little while, the heavens were black with wind-swept clouds. So I don't believe there was a storm when Elijah said he heard something. That was in his spirit. He heard, and by faith he heard but he declared it. That took faith. In a little while, the heavens were black with windswept clouds and there was a great rain. Do you think any of the people there were saying, I mean, what about those 12 jars of water that we wasted earlier? Do you think any of them cared? Do we go back and look at the resources that we wasted or complain about the resources that God's having us invest somewhere in his kingdom? And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about time, talents, treasures. God leads us to sow, and it's going to come back as an as a abundance. And then Ahab went to Jezreel. So Ahab had been silent this whole time, almost as if he were in shock. And people had to think for him, go eat and drink. Go hit your chariot. I can, I can picture he was just dazed. He had just watched all of those prophets. Uh, what's the... Slain. Thank you. I just want to say slew. Saw all those prophets slain. He knows he's going to get it from Jezebel. Don't, don't make Jezebel mad, right? Imagine being married to her. He'd been silent this whole time. He has, now, he has not uttered a single word that we know of in Scripture. It doesn't say. Since verse 17, when he said to Elijah, Are you he who troubles Israel? And I'm sure Elijah would, because we know he's, he likes to mock. I'm sure Elijah would have liked to have said now, no, hey, no Ahab, I am the one who through the living God just ended a three-year drought, brought on by your lovely wife and the worship of her God. I also just cleaned out God's house for you by removing all of those evil prophets that you allowed in turning the hearts of God's people back to him because I was obedient to every single instruction of the Lord and had the faith to believe that God would show up. What have you been doing for God's people? How satisfying would that have been for Elijah, right? But he doesn't say that. We don't need to have the last word, church. As satisfying as it might be sometimes. We need to let God have the last word. So it isn't just a victory for us. It's not about our victory. It's about his victory through us for his intended plans and purposes. Amen? And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. He girded up his loins and ran before Ahab, who was in a chariot, mind you. Don't forget that fact. Last time I shared when we talked about Jeremiah, if you remember, a verse that says some of us were never meant to run with people 
but to contend with horses. And here was Elijah doing just that in the natural, outrunning a chariot. To the entrance of Jezreel, nearly 20 miles. So after the day that Elijah just had spiritually, in terms of his faith output, every time we said that took faith, also think about his physical output that day. Physically, Elijah stood around watching the prophets of Baal for half the day do their thing before he mocked them for a little while. Good mocking can take a lot out of you. Then he rebuilt the altar of the Lord and maneuvered 12 stones, however large they were, before digging a trench around the altar. And then he prepared the sacrifice. And let's not forget, he also slew the 450 prophets of Baal and however many of the other prophets Got saloon. Sloan? Slain? Slain. Sloan? Sloan. Yet Elijah still had the energy to run ahead of Ahab, who was in a chariot running nearly 20 miles. And I want to add something that I never saw before, and Nikki and I talked about it last week. Elijah ran in the rain and mud. And I never noticed that because it doesn't say it, but if you pay attention to the story, <clears throat> there was a great rain, and that didn't stop him to outrun a horse. Elijah does this to be there when Ahab tells Jezebel what happened. That's what I believe. And this is a Jamieism. I don't think that Elijah was hoping to get there first out of spite. Just to see the look on Jezebel's face and to give her that, you know, <laughs> that take that smile. Come on, ladies, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Us married men are uh, smart enough to know that we would never survive if we used the take that smile. Right, men? Women have those extra take that smile muscles in their face that men just don't have. But I believe that Elijah was motivated in, 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 and in anticipation. Motivated and in anticipation because of all that had just happened. That maybe Ahab, still in shock, had along with Israel had a heart change. That's what I believe. And therefore, as Ahab relayed the events to his wife Jezebel, maybe, just maybe, she would have a change of heart as well. And then the people of Israel would be free from her control and allowed to worship the living God, who had just proved himself that day over her God. And I know what some of you are thinking when I say that, but it's Jezebel, right? How many of you thought that? Let's be honest, but it's Jezebel. Go to Revelations 2, or you can write it down and look at it later yourself. Revelations 2, 20 through 21. And it says, but I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess claiming to be inspired and who is teaching and leading astray my servants. And look at verse 21. I gave her time to repent. I gave her time to repent. But she has no desire to repent of her immorality, symbolic or idolatry and refuses to do so. But I gave her time to repent. And I believe that this is in reference, this verse, to all that God had accomplished through Elijah that day. Which may have been the final opportunity. I don't know, I'm not God, I don't know Jezebel's heart. It might have been her final opportunity to see the error of her ways and to acknowledge that the living God of Elijah was above her powerless God and to repent. And I believe that's what motivated Elijah to run ahead of those chariots that day. We cannot look at certain people in our lives, church, no matter who they are or what they have done, to us or to others, and have the audacity to put a limit on who we think God is capable of forgiving. 
and ever say, but it's Jezebel or insert name here, whoever is in your heart when I say that. God gives everyone an opportunity to repent and to turn their heart towards him. He is a God of righteous judgment, but also a God of love and mercy. Amen. And the worship team can come up as I continue for a minute. First Kings 19, 1 through 4. And again, a lot happens between the verses that I'm sharing you. I encourage you to always read. I'm just jumping ahead to um, tie things together here. First Kings 19, 1 through 4. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had slain all the prophets of Baal with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Jezebel threatens to kill Elijah within 24 hours and to do to him as he did to her prophets. Probably not how Elijah thought this would play out after the day he just had and all that he had just accomplished and endured. How many of us have ever been there before? When after all we've done in our own strength and in obedience to what God has asked us to do, the end result isn't exactly what we expected or hoped for. I've been there, church. And what I have found is if we find ourselves in that place, it is an opportune time for the enemy to come against us with hopelessness and fear. Not in my house. Not in this house. And in verse 3, then he was afraid. I'll be honest, I, when studying this out, I struggled with this story. I did. I struggled. How could Elijah be afraid? After everything he just accomplished, how could Elijah be afraid? He was afraid and arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba of Judah, which I looked up was south and in the complete opposite direction of Mount Carmel where he had just had a great victory. Over 80 miles after the day he just had. And out of Jezebel's realm, it says. And it says, and he left his servant there. So put a pin in there too. That's what we're going we're gonna to come to that either next week or the week after. Because his servant is mentioned twice and I want to talk about that. So keep that fact in mind. In verse 4, it says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a lone broom or juniper tree and asked that he might die. He said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. So here we have arrived at Elijah's desperate moment. And I'm going to stop this message there. And I'm not leaving it on a negative note. I promise you that we are done. It will be encouraging. 